The man known to history as Tsar Nicholas II of Russia was born Grand Duke Nicholas Alexandrovich Romanov on the 18th of May 1868 at the Alexander Palace in Tsarskoye Selo, the imperial retreat outside St. Petersburg, the capital of the Russian Empire. His father, Tsarevich Alexander Alexandrovich, was the second son of Tsar Alexander II of Russia. The younger Alexander was given an ordinary education and prepared for a life of military service when his elder brother, Tsarevich Nicholas, died in 1865 at the age of 21. Following the death of Nicholas, Alexander became heir to the Russian throne and married his late brother's fiancée. Upon his father's death in 1881, Alexander assumed the throne as Tsar Alexander III. Although most of his ancestors were German, the bulky, bearded Alexander resembled a Russian peasant, and his legendary reputation for strength was reflected in his tendency to bend a fork with his bare hands for entertainment during state dinners. Nicholas II's mother, Maria Fyodorovna, was born Princess Dagmar of Denmark in 1847, five years before her father became King Christian IX of Denmark. In 1863, Dagmar's sister, Princess Alexandra, married Prince Albert Edward, the future Edward VII of the United Kingdom. In September 1864, when she was not yet 17, Dagmar was engaged to Tsarevich Nicholas of Russia, but after his death the following year, it was decided that she would marry his younger brother, Tsarevich Alexander, converting to Russian Orthodox Christianity and taking the name of Maria Fyodorovna. The couple would have six children, of whom the future Nicholas II was the eldest. The second son, named Alexander, died before his first birthday, but the remaining children, two sons named George and Michael, and two daughters named Ksenia and Olga, all survived into adulthood. The Romanov family had ruled Russia since 1613, when the nobleman Mikhail Fyodorovich Romanov was elected Tsar at the end of a 15-year period of anarchy and Polish occupation, known as the Time of Troubles. Nicholas II's life and reign proved as troublesome as the events three centuries earlier that placed his ancestor on the Russian throne. At his birth, the Russian Empire was the world's largest country, stretching from Poland in the west to the Pacific coast in the east, bordering the Arctic Ocean in the north with its southern frontiers in Central Asia. This vast country owed its origins to the Grand Principality of Moscow, a modest medieval state ruled by princes of the Rurikid dynasty, descendants of the Viking chieftain Rurik, who ruled the lands collectively known as the Rus, from the city of Kiev in the 9th century. After the Mongol conquest, Moscow became the most powerful of the Russian principalities over the course of the 14th century by a combination of military force, extortion, and fidelity to the Mongol or Tatar Khan. During the following century, the Muscovites claimed the legacy of the Eastern Roman Empire after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, claiming the title of Tsar, derived from Caesar, before expelling the Tatars subjugating the wealthy merchant republic of Novgorod to the northwest and beginning its expansion eastwards towards Siberia. At the beginning of the 18th century, after a century of turmoil, Tsar Peter the Great founded the city of St. Petersburg and defeated Sweden in the Great Northern War, proclaiming the Russian Empire in 1721. At the end of the century, Ukraine and Crimea and parts of Poland were brought under Russian imperial rule by Catherine the Great. After repelling Napoleon's ill-fated invasion of 1812, Russia became one of the dominant powers on the European continent, and in 1814, Tsar Alexander I entered Paris in triumph at the head of a coalition army that forced Napoleon to abdicate. Both Catherine and Alexander were inspired by liberal ideas of the European Enlightenment, but they found it difficult to reform a system of authoritarian rule 
which they relied on to maintain the integrity of their state with its wide open frontiers. In the decades after the Napoleonic Wars, Russia retained its reputation as the continent's strongest military power, but despite their resplendent uniforms on parade, the Russian army was defeated in the Crimean War, which exposed the weaknesses in the Russian administrative and economic system. After Nicholas's grandfather, Tsar Alexander II, came to the throne in 1855, he embarked on a reform program to modernize the Russian Empire and maintain its great power status on the international stage, while dealing with the increasing political consciousness of the urban classes and the rise of nationalism in a multi-ethnic empire where fewer than half of the population was Russian. In 1861, Alexander abolished serfdom and gave peasants free economic rights. But the newly emancipated serfs were obliged to pay redemption dues to the government for 49 years to compensate their former owners. In 1864, trial by jury was introduced, and elected local councils known as Zemtsva were established for rural areas and later cities and towns. In order to address the deficiencies in military organization in the Crimea, in 1874 universal conscription was introduced, and corporal punishment was banned in the army. Nicholas spent his childhood with an affectionate and overprotective mother, and a warm-hearted but intimidating father, a combination that may have contributed to his immaturity as a young adult. Like other European families, Nicholas's parents provided the general framework for his education and upbringing, but he spent most of the childhood supervised by governesses and governors. Between seven and ten years old, Nicholas received lessons from his governess, Alexandra Olengren, Aged 10, his upbringing was entrusted to the military governor, General Grigory Danilovich, who invited specialist tutors to teach the young Grand Duke Russian, French, English, German, mathematics, geography, chemistry, and history, which was Nicholas's favorite subject. Nicholas had a close relationship with his tutor, Charles Heath, an Englishman who taught at the Alexander Lyceum the prestigious school for the aristocratic elite in Saskoye Selo. Under Heath's influence, Nicholas adopted the reserved manner of an English gentleman, an attitude that would contribute to his reputation as a weak and indecisive ruler. In March 1881, when Nicholas was 13 years old, his grandfather, Tsar Alexander II, was assassinated by the Socialist Revolutionary Organization the People's Will, while returning to the Winter Palace from a military inspection. Having survived six previous assassination attempts during his reign, the mortally wounded Alexander had his legs blown off by a bomb and was carried to the Winter Palace, where he died a couple of hours later. While Russian Tsars had often been violently removed from power by ambitious family members in palace coups, this was the first time a Russian monarch had been killed by revolutionaries who aimed to overthrow the monarchy. While he honored his late father's memory by building the Church of the Savior on spilled blood at the site of the assassination, Tsar Alexander III reversed many of his predecessors' liberal reforms and cracked down on left-wing revolutionary terrorist groups. In May 1887, after an attempt on the Tsar's life on the sixth anniversary of Alexander II's killing was uncovered, the revolutionary terrorist Alexander Ulyanov was one of five members of the People's Will executed for his part in the plot. Alexander's death led his younger brother Vladimir to take a greater interest in revolutionary politics. After his grandfather's death and the accession of his father Alexander III, Nicholas assumed the title of Tsarevich and became heir to the throne. He continued to live under the supervision of General Danilovich until the age of 17, when he began his political education at the hands of some of the leading statesmen of the empire. The greatest influence on the teenage Nicholas was Konstantin Pobedonoschev, the conservative law professor who served as the secular head of the Orthodox Church. 
Bobodinostyev believed that Russians' communitarian political traditions were unsuited to representative democracy and regarded the peasantry, who were largely isolated from Western liberal and socialist ideas in the cities, as the basis of Russian monarchism. Nicholas was also taught economics by Nikolai Bunga, the liberal minister of finance, from 1881 to 1886. Though the Russian economy developed rapidly during the reign of Alexander III and Bunga was comfortable in the world of wealthy bankers and industrialists, Nicholas's understanding of economic theory remained poor throughout his life, and he would rely on the advice of ministers on economic issues. In October 1888, while Nicholas and the imperial family were returning from the Crimea, the imperial train derailed at Borki in Ukraine. The roof of the dining car collapsed, but Tsar Alexander used his legendary strength to hold it up, allowing the children to escape unharmed. At the age of 19, Nicholas was commissioned into the Preobrazhensky Guards, the senior regiment of the imperial army. As with elite regiments in other European countries, the Preobrazhensky's officers received little military training, but Nicholas was able to enjoy the society of the wealthy young aristocrats who served as guards officers. During the 18th and 19th centuries, it was common for young European aristocrats and royals to embark on a grand tour of Europe, to deepen their knowledge of art and culture, and to see the monumental remnants of Greek and Roman antiquity for themselves. Tsar Alexander turned his attention eastward towards Asia, and in October 1890, Nicholas was sent on an eastern grand tour, accompanied by Prince Esper Uchtomsky, an authority on Asian culture, and after brief stops in Austria and Greece, where he picked up his cousin Prince George of Greece, Nicholas visited the more exotic destinations of Egypt, India, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, the Dutch East Indies, modern Indonesia, the Kingdom of Siam, now Thailand, and parts of China and Japan, before returning home to St. Petersburg across Siberia. In May 1891, while Nicholas was in Otsa in Japan, he was the target of an assassination attempt by a local policeman. Though he received a saber wound to the face, Prince George saved his life by intercepting the second blow. Nicholas cut short the rest of his trip and returned to St. Petersburg overland in August. He had been a member of the State Council and Committee of Ministers since his 21st birthday in 1889, and in 1893 he was appointed to chair a special committee on the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway. In 1890, Nicholas began an affair with a 17-year-old Matilda Cieszynska, a Polish ballerina of the Imperial Ballet. Though the affair was actively encouraged by his parents, as heir to the Russian throne, he was expected to marry a European princess. In 1884, Nicholas was present at his uncle Grand Duke Sergei's wedding to Princess Elizabeth of Hesse, one of the many German princely states that supplied brides for European royal houses. It was there that Nicholas met Elizabeth's 12-year-old sister, Princess Alex, who was Queen Victoria of England's favourite grandchild and lover of all things English. By the early 1890s, Nicholas was determined to marry the beautiful Princess Alex, and he proposed to her in April 1894 while attending the wedding of her brother, Grand Duke Ernst Ludwig of Hesse, in the German city of Coburg. The highly religious Alex initially rejected the proposal, as she was unwilling to give up her Lutheran faith in favour of Russian Orthodoxy, but a few days later she changed her mind and would soon become a zealous convert. Despite his seemingly robust constitution, Tsar Alexander III's health began to fail in 1894, and by late summer he was diagnosed with kidney disease attributed to the impact of the Borki train disaster six years earlier. In the autumn, the Tsar went to the Livadia Palace in Crimea to recuperate, and by mid-October, Tsarevich Nicholas was deputizing for his father. 
On the 22nd of October, Princess Alex arrived to receive her prospective father-in-law's blessing, and on the 1st of November 1894, Tsar Alexander III died at the age of 49, leaving his 26-year-old son as Nicholas II, Tsar of Russia. On the 26th of November, less than a month after the late Tsar's death, court mourning was lifted for the wedding of Nicholas and his bride, who had converted to orthodoxy and taken the name Alexandra Fyodorovna. Although she took a great interest in Russian religion and culture, the intelligent and serious empress was ill at ease in St. Petersburg society and resented the court precedence enjoyed by her mother-in-law, Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Nevertheless, Nicholas and Alexandra had a happy marriage, and the imperial couple would have four daughters and one son between 1895 and 1904. During Nicholas's reign, the imperial family's main residence was the Alexander Palace in Tsarskoye Selo. Though the palace had a neoclassical exterior, yellow walls and white columns, its interiors were decorated in a Victorian Gothic style to suit Alexandra's tastes. The family spent summers at Peterhof, around 20 miles to the west, and made occasional visits to imperial hunting lodges in Poland and the Livadia Palace in Crimea. Nicholas and his family enjoyed excursions to the Finnish coast on the imperial yacht, the Standart, which was also used on occasion for state visits to European countries. For the first decade of Nicholas's reign, the imperial family hosted grand balls in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg during the winter, but after 1903, the imperial family was increasingly isolated from St. Petersburg society. Aside from occasional holidays and international trips, Nicholas kept a strict routine, starting the day at 8 o'clock with a swim, before having breakfast and a walk in the extensive Alexander Park. From 9.30 he attended to court business for an hour, before receiving reports from his ministers between 10.30 and lunch at 1.00. After a 45-minute lunch, Nicholas would receive ambassadors and foreign guests in the afternoon, before tea with the family at 5 o'clock. Between 6 and 8 in the evening, there were more ministerial reports. Dinner began at 8, after which Nicholas would join Alexandra and the children in the Empress's boudoir. After 10, Nicholas returned to his study and sometimes worked late into the night. After becoming Tsar on his father's death, Nicholas admitted that he was unprepared to take the throne. The young Tsar was indecisive and lacked confidence, and it was often said that the most powerful individual in Russia was the last person who had spoken to the Tsar. Empress Alexandra frequently attempted to strengthen her husband's resolution by reminding him that he was the Tsar and was appointed by God. Nicholas's imperial majesty would have to appear in its full glory before the people at his coronation in May 1896. Although St. Petersburg had been the capital since 1712, the coronation ceremony of the Tsars continued to be held in the former capital of Moscow. On the 26th of May 1896, Nicholas was crowned in a solemn three-hour ceremony held in the Dormition Cathedral in the Moscow Kremlin. Four days later, on the 30th of May, a large public celebration was to be held at the Khodinka Field on the outskirts of the city, with Nicholas and Alexandra set to arrive at noon. By six in the morning, over half a million people had already arrived, and when rumors spread that there were not enough complimentary souvenirs for everyone, those at the back pushed forwards, leading to a stampede which killed over a thousand people and injured thousands more. By the time the imperial family arrived in the afternoon, the field had been cleaned up. That evening, Nicholas and Alexandra attended a grand ball organized by the French embassy to celebrate the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894. While the imperial couple did not wish to attend the ball, and visited the wounded in hospitals the following day, the image of the Tsar dancing on the day of a great tragedy made a bad first impression. Nicholas began his reign with few close friends whom he could bring into government, and instead relied on advice from ministers inherited from his father. 
He continued to be guided by Pobodonoschev's conservatism, and for the first six years of his reign, he did not deviate very far from his father's policies. Nicholas's desire to please everyone around him and his unwillingness to confront those who disagreed with him resulted in incoherent and contradictory policy-making. Rather than decide policy collectively through the Committee of Ministers, the Tsar preferred to make decisions by meeting ministers individually. The Tsar's main interests were in foreign, defense, and security policy, and outside these areas, ministers exercised considerable power in their own departments. Later in his reign, Nicholas suspected that powerful and effective ministers were usurping his powers as Tsar, and he played his ministers off against each other to assert his own authority, undermining the effectiveness of his government. Like many of his predecessors, Nicholas was suspicious of the bureaucrats who served him, and believed that as Tsar he had a direct connection to the people. The Tsar considered himself a father to his subjects, and was known to deal with petitions personally, no matter how trivial. Among Nicholas's ministers, the most influential during the early part of his reign was Minister of Finance Sergei Vita, who had spent 20 years working in the railway industry before being appointed Director of Railway Affairs by Minister of Finance Ivan Vishnogradsky. Vishnogradsky launched a program of industrial development, funded by foreign loans and increasing taxes on peasants, and protected by high tariffs, which increased the prices of imported industrial products. These policies were adopted and expanded by Vita upon his arrival at the Ministry of Finance in 1892, and became known as the Vita system. The finance minister believed that rapid industrialization and economic modernization was essential if Russia was to avoid becoming economically exploited by the world's industrial powers, a fate that seemed inevitable for the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and the Qing Empire in China. Vita recognized that the peasants and urban poor would suffer in the process, but argued that only by developing Russian industry using a combination of state revenues and foreign capital and technology could Russia be able to compete with Britain, France, Germany and the United States. Vita's advocacy of the industrial economy was unpopular among the Russian landed aristocracy, who were skeptical of capitalism and favored the development of the agricultural economy. When Vita proposed adopting the gold standard in 1896 in order to attract foreign investment, he faced considerable opposition among his fellow ministers as it would increase the cost of borrowing, and it was only the forceful intervention of the Tsar on behalf of Vita that allowed the finance minister to have his way. With his background in the rail industry, Vita took a special interest in the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway, intended to link Moscow to the port of Vladivostok in the Far East. In May 1891, while returning home from his Asian tour, Nicholas attended the ceremonies marking the start of construction on the railway in Vladivostok, and after becoming Tsar, he maintained his interest in the Far East, believing that Russia was in a perfect position to exploit economic advantages from the weak Chinese Empire. In 1895, Japan defeated China in an eight-month war, and at the Treaty of Shimonoseki, Japan secured possession of the Liaodong Peninsula in southern Manchuria, including the strategic naval base of Port Arthur. Since the Japanese presence in Manchuria undermined Russia's own imperial ambitions in the Celestial Empire, Russia organized an international coalition with France and Germany to force Japan to hand their gains back to China. Under Vita's influence, Russia was given the right to build a section of the Trans-Siberian Railway through northern Manchuria, reducing the length of the route. In March 1898, after Germany seized the Chinese port of Qingdao, Nicholas ensured that Russia secured a lease on Port Arthur and the Liaodong Peninsula, while the British were given the port of Wei Hai Wei. In 1900, the Boxer Rebellion broke out in northern China in opposition to foreign influence in the empire. The Chinese imperial government sympathized with the Boxers and did little to suppress the rebellion, 
while the international community sought and received help from home. Russia was among the eight nations which joined together to suppress the boxers, but Russian forces remained in Manchuria to protect the railway and assert Russian economic control over the province. Although Vita's policies led to rapid economic growth, the industrialization process was accompanied by the movement of peasants from the countryside to work in factories in urban centers. The cities were unable to provide the necessary housing and social infrastructure to cope with the demand, and living and working conditions were poor. In the meantime, the increase in literacy among factory workers encouraged the creation of trade unions to defend the rights of workers. In many of these unions, radical revolutionary ideas circulated calling for the overthrow of the Tsar and his regime. This industrialization led to not only strikes in the cities, but also peasant riots in the countryside, prompted by Vita's high taxes and tariffs, which led to several famines over the course of the 1890s. Vita recognized the condition of the peasantry, but was unwilling to ease the tax burden, and instead proposed radical land reform. Vita suggested abolishing the peasant commune, the centuries-old system under which a village and the land around it was owned collectively by the peasant community and giving peasants full property rights to their land. The political stability of the Russian Empire was threatened not only by workers and peasants, but also by the intellectual classes. As in many autocratic regimes, the most radical group were university students, and in 1899, Nicholas faced student riots across the country. Although some leading instigators were expelled and conscripted to the army as a punishment, Nicholas recognized that some of the students' complaints were justified, and the Ministry of Education took steps to abolish the hated classical curriculum and to give students greater choice in the courses they studied. While Nicholas hoped that the Russian education system could inspire a sense of patriotism and support for the state, university professors and even officials in the Ministry of Education sympathized with liberal and radical ideas and resisted any decrees to impose conservative sentiments upon students. By 1900, there were three distinct political groups forming the political opposition to Nicholas II. The Socialist Revolutionary Party formed in 1901 and led by Viktor Chernov was the successor to the people's will and the agrarian socialist movements founded in the 1860s. The SRs believed that peasants and workers should join together in leading the socialist revolution to overthrow the Tsar and were popular in both urban and rural areas. The SRs promoted revolutionary terror and were responsible for assassinating the hardline Minister of Internal Affairs, Vyacheslav von Pleva, in 1904. The Social Democrats, on the other hand, owed their allegiance to the Marxist tradition and believed that the urban workers would serve as the vanguard of any socialist revolution. In 1903, the Social Democratic Party split into two factions, the extreme Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Ulyanov, better known as Lenin, while the more moderate Mensheviks were led by Julius Martov. The third strand of opposition to the Tsar were the liberals, who supported civil rights and constitutional government, where political power is shared by the monarch and a democratic assembly representing the people. The liberals, primarily influential in the Zemtsva around the country, drew their support from middle-class and upper-class individuals, Though they hoped to expand their support to the working classes. The political instability in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century prompted Interior Minister von Pleva to remark in 1903, what this country needs is a short, victorious war to stem the tide of revolution. Pleva's comment was in reference to Minister of War General Alexei Kuropatkin, who warned that Russia's Far Eastern adventures were undermining its defenses in Europe. In February 1904, Russia and Japan went to war over control of Manchuria and Korea. Though Nicholas had hoped to avoid war, he believed that the Russian military would easily crush the Japanese. Contrary to the expectations of the Tsar and the international community, 
the Japanese inflicted a series of heavy defeats on the Russians. In April 1904, the flagship of the Russian Pacific Fleet struck a mine near Port Arthur, killing Admiral Stepan Makarov, the Russian Navy's most talented naval officer. In early September 1904, Kuropatkin's army was defeated by a Japanese army half its size at the Battle of Liaoyang, forcing him to abandon the city. Kuropatkin expected reinforcements from European Russia via the Trans-Siberian Railway, but parts of the railroad were not yet complete. In the meantime, the Japanese laid siege to Port Arthur and took the port in February 1905, destroying the Russian Pacific Fleet in the process. Later that month, the Japanese army defeated Kuropatkin at Mukden, now known as Shenyang, and forced the Russians to retreat into northern Manchuria. The key battle of the war took place at sea at the end of May 1905, when Admiral Zinovy Grosjesvensky's 2nd Pacific Squadron, which had sailed around the world on an eight-month voyage from the Baltic Sea, was annihilated by Admiral Togo Heihachiro at the Straits of Tsushima. After mediation from President Theodore Roosevelt of the United States, the Russo-Japanese War ended with the signing of the Treaty of Portsmouth in September recognizing Japanese claims over Korea and resulting in Russia's evacuation of Manchuria. In line with Pleva's expectations, Russian setbacks in the Russo-Japanese War had made revolution more likely, and on the 28th of July 1904, while on his way to meet the Tsar, Pleva was killed by a bomb thrown by a socialist revolutionary terrorist. Nicholas had appointed Pleva Minister of Internal Affairs in 1902, following the assassination of his predecessor, Dmitry Sipyagin, hoping that the hardline Pleva would act as a counterweight to Vita, who was beginning to lose the Tsar's confidence over the political instability caused by his economic reforms. Like many Russian conservatives, Pleva believed that the workers and the peasants were more loyal to the state and presided over a policy of repression against the political parties and the radical urban intelligentsia. Pleva was a notorious anti-Semite and considered to be responsible for the pogrom in the Moldovan capital of Kishinev in April 1903, during which an anti-Semitic mob killed almost 50 Jews. Though Nicholas condemned the killings and removed the local governor, he did little to stem the pogroms between 1903 and 1906, during which over 2,000 Jews were killed, the bloodiest of which claimed the lives of 400 Jews in the Ukrainian port of Odessa in 1905. Following Pleva's assassination, Nicholas appointed the liberal Prince Pyotr Svieta Polkmirsky as his successor, seemingly in response to his mother's pleas not to appoint another hardliner to the ministry. Svieta Polkmirsky proposed a program of reforms, including religious toleration, civil rights, and greater influence on central government by elected representatives from across the country. While the Minister of Internal Affairs believed that the reforms were necessary to avoid revolution, Grand Duke Sergei led the Conservatives in attempting to block the reform program. Not long after Nicholas rejected the Interior Minister's central policy of representative government in December 1904, Svieta Polkmirsky resigned from office. On Sunday, the 22nd of January 1905, tens of thousands of unarmed protesters marched on the Winter Palace under the leadership of Father Gapon, a priest and trade union leader in St. Petersburg. Among Gapon's demands for political reform, were for the Tsar to hold a constituent assembly to deliver a constitutional government in Russia. The protesters were carrying religious icons and singing patriotic songs, including the imperial anthem God Save the Tsar, appealing to the Tsar as their protector. Nicholas was away at Tsarkoye Selo at the time, and while there was no question of him accepting Gapon's demands, the decision to police the event using infantry soldiers resulted in the death of several hundred protesters, as the outnumbered soldiers blocking the paths to Palace Square opened fire at the columns of demonstrators advancing against them. While Nicholas expressed regret at the fatalities, 
The events of Bloody Sunday undermined the Tsar's claim to be the protector of his subjects. On the 17th of February, 1905, Grand Duke Sergei was assassinated by socialist revolutionary terrorists in the Kremlin. Nicholas responded by offering to establish an advisory representative body, but he refused to consider relinquishing his powers as absolute monarch. The Tsar believed that constitutional government would make Russia more vulnerable to revolution and anarchy, while also considering it his duty to preserve the authority he was given by God. As a hereditary monarch, Nicholas also considered it his duty to God and Russia to produce a son and heir. Between 1895 and 1901, Nicholas and Alexandra had four daughters in succession, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. According to the Imperial Succession Law of 1797, women could not inherit the throne unless all male claimants were extinguished. As a result, Nicholas's younger brother George remained the heir to the throne until his death in 1899, upon which their youngest brother, Michael, became the new heir. When Nicholas fell gravely ill in the autumn of 1900, there was some discussion about changing the laws of succession so that Grand Duchess Olga could succeed him, but the Tsar's recovery averted succession talk. On the 12th of August 1904, Nicholas and Alexandra were granted their wish of a son, whom they named Alexei, after the 17th century Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, a pious and gentle ruler who laid the foundations for his son Peter the Great's modernization of the country by pursuing a program of moderate reform. Nicholas and Alexandra were naturally delighted to have a boy, but their happiness was tempered when it emerged that Alexei suffered from haemophilia, a disease inherited from Alexandra's grandmother, Queen Victoria, which impaired the ability of blood to clot, meaning that cuts and bruises could potentially prove fatal. Alexandra's concern about her son's condition caused her own health to collapse, leading her to turn more to her faith. Rather than solving a problem, Tsarevich Alexei was another addition to his parents' list of anxieties. The defeats on land and sea during the Russo-Japanese War highlighted the weakness of the Russian state and its military commanders, and contributed to a decline in the Tsar's prestige. While news of Mokden and Tsushima made their way to St. Petersburg, strikes and disturbances continued throughout the country, reaching a peak at the beginning of October with strikes in Moscow and St. Petersburg. When the railway men went on strike, it paralyzed political and economic activity and prevented officials from traveling between St. Petersburg and Moscow. After Sergei Vita advised the Tsar to make concessions to end the unrest, on the 30th of October, Nicholas issued a manifesto drawn up by Vita promising an elected assembly with legislative powers and to create a council of ministers whose chairman would effectively have the powers of a prime minister. A week later, Vita was made prime minister, but despite his promises of restoring peace, the unrest continued and a Soviet of workers' deputies dominated by Leon Trotsky was established in St. Petersburg, while in December, the Bolsheviks led an uprising in Moscow. Trotsky would later describe the events in 1905 as a dress rehearsal for the revolution, which would overthrow the Tsar 12 years later. For the time being, Nicholas remained in power as the revolution was brought under control by Pyotr Darnova, the Minister of Internal Affairs, who reasserted government control over the transport and communications network and arrested members of the St. Petersburg Soviet. By the end of 1905, many liberals rallied to the government after being horrified at the radicalism of the masses. Most liberals formed the Constitutional Democratic Party, nicknamed Cadets, hoping to use the Legislative Assembly to carry out further reforms while a conservative minority, who were satisfied by the concessions granted by the October Manifesto, joined the Octoberist Party. The new constitution was published in the spring of the following year as the Fundamental Law of April 1906. 
As promised, the law created the State Duma, an elected assembly which served as the lower house of a bicameral legislature. The upper house was the reformed State Council, whose members were appointed by the Tsar and the nobility. Nicholas continued to assert his supreme authority and reserved for himself powers to dissolve the two parliamentary bodies or to place provinces under a state of emergency. When Tsar Nicholas II opened the Duma at the Torid Palace in St. Petersburg on the 27th of April 1906, he was a month shy of his 38th birthday and had been on the Russian throne for more than a decade. During this period, the Russian economy continued to industrialize, but the revolutionary organizations which had been driven underground by his father had re-emerged. Nicholas managed to gain control of Port Arthur and southern Manchuria, only to lose it shortly thereafter with a humiliating defeat to Japan. Despite the imperial majesty on display at the Tarid Palace, Nicholas had barely survived the revolution of 1905 and was forced into taking the first steps to creating a constitutional government, which he was fundamentally opposed to. The new constitutional experiment began poorly, and the Tsar resented sharing executive power with Vita. While peasant disturbances continued in the countryside, the previously decisive Vita could not make up his mind how to respond, leaving it up to Dornova to pacify the country through military force. Nicholas kept Vita in office long enough to secure a foreign loan, allowing Russia to remain on the gold standard before dismissing him in May, replacing him with the ineffectual Ivan Goromaikin. Although the electoral law for the Duma had been weighted towards the peasantry, the traditional supporters of the monarchy, when the State Duma opened its first session in April 1906, it was dominated by the liberal cadets and the socialist Trudoviks. The mainstream socialist parties, the socialist revolutionaries and social democrats, had decided to boycott the first Duma elections. Even so, the body's demands for parliamentary government and land reform were too radical for the Tsar, who dissolved the body in July. Elections for the second Duma in January 1907 returned a legislature even further to the left after the SDs and SRs agreed to participate. The second Duma was soon dissolved, and the electoral laws changed to ensure a more conservative legislature. While Nicholas was struggling to adapt to life as a constitutional monarch, the imperial court welcomed the presence of Grigory Rasputin, a Siberian peasant and religious mystic. Rasputin was introduced to the imperial couple in late 1905 by Princess Anastasia of Montenegro who would later marry the Tsar's uncle, Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich. Over the coming years, Rasputin gained considerable influence over Nicholas and Alexandra for his ability to stop Tsarevich Alexei's bleeding. Despite his condition and regular warnings from his parents, Alexei was an active child and would occasionally hurt himself. On more than one occasion, when the Tsarevich appeared to be dying, Rasputin's intervention whether by touching the child or through his prayers, would seemingly cure the young boy almost instantly. The imperial couple regarded Rasputin's presence as a sign of the people's support for the monarchy, though his political influence was often exaggerated by political opponents who supported the separation of the state and the Orthodox Church. Rasputin's presence at court damaged the prestige of the Tsar and his family, and was deemed an embarrassment by educated society. But Nicholas and Alexandra resisted calls from Prime Minister Pyotr Stolypin to expel Rasputin from St. Petersburg. Stolypin had succeeded Danova as Minister of Internal Affairs in the spring of 1906 before becoming Prime Minister in July. Before being promoted to ministerial level, he had served as the governor of Saratov province in southern Russia and at the age of 44, he was much younger than the Tsar's previous ministers. Stalypin continued to crack down on peasant disturbances, and among his opponents, the hangman's noose was nicknamed Stalypin's necktie, while the trains carrying peasants into Siberia were known as Stalypin's carriages. 
Although a conservative nobleman, Stolypin and agricultural minister Alexander Krivoshin proposed a land reform program to weaken peasant communes and encourage the development of family smallholdings. He also attempted to stimulate the economic development of Siberia by offering to give each peasant 40 acres of land to cultivate alongside other financial inducements. He was a talented orator who made powerful speeches in the Duma and he established a close working relationship with Alexander Guchkov, whose Octoberist party was the largest in the Third Duma. This alliance began to fail in 1909 and 1910, when Stalipin's proposals to strengthen the Zemtsva and increase social protections for factory workers were opposed by the landowners and industrialists who dominated the Duma. In the meantime, Stalipin and Guchkov's efforts to increase legislative control over the army damaged his relationship with the Tsar. Stalipin's plans to expand the Zemtsva system to Ukraine and Belarus narrowly passed the Duma, but were defeated in the State Council in March 1911. Stalipin responded by threatening to resign, unless the Tsar were to use his emergency powers to suspend the legislature and adopt the Western Zemtsva bill by decree. Nicholas agreed to these conditions and retained Stalipin, but the Prime Minister's demands infuriated both the Tsar and the legislature. On the 14th of September 1911, while attending a performance at the Kiev Opera with the Tsar and his eldest daughters, Stalipin was shot by a leftist revolutionary assassin and died four days later on the 18th. The assassin was hanged a week after Stalipin's death, but Nicholas gave orders to drop the investigation, prompting rumors that the assassination had been planned by supporters of the Tsar. Stalipin was succeeded by Finance Minister Vladimir Kavkavtsov, but the new Prime Minister lacked the presence of his predecessor and was a weak leader. Having remained at the head of the Finance Ministry, Kavkavtsov's desire to control spending led to clashes with General Vladimir Sukomlinov, the Minister of War, and Alexander Krivozhin at Agriculture. Sukomlinov had been appointed by the Tsar in 1909 to resist Talipin's efforts to give the Duma greater control over the armed forces and demanded increased investment in the army and navy. Krivozhin was responsible for enacting Stalipin's land reforms and provided cheap credit through the Peasant Land Bank to allow peasants to buy their own land from nobles. He encouraged the development of schools, and by 1914, around 60% of Russian children received a primary education. In February 1914, Krivozhin managed to outmaneuver Kavkavtsov by persuading the Tsar to appoint his friend Peter Bark as finance minister and the powerless Gorimikin as prime minister, allowing the minister of agriculture to become the dominant figure in the government. In the meantime, in 1913, Nicholas had asserted his control over security policy by appointing Nikolai Maklakov as minister of internal affairs. With the Tsar's support, Maklakov cracked down on the revolutionary press and unsuccessfully attempted to reduce the Duma's powers. In 1914, St. Petersburg was hit with a series of strikes, but the rest of the country remained calm. Widespread demonstrations of popular support in 1913, during the celebrations of 300 years of Romanov rule, convinced Nicholas that he continued to enjoy considerable support across the country. After its inauspicious start, the constitutional experiment was bringing an element of stability, despite Stalipin's assassination, and there was a chance that with a strong prime minister, such as Krivozhin, to carry out his agenda and manage parliamentary politics, Nicholas could be a constitutional monarch, like his cousin King George V in Britain. However, after Nicholas limited the electorate in 1907, most of the Russian population remained without political representation, and the workers and many peasants were ready to rise up against the Tsar at any sign of weakness in the imperial regime. The Tsar had been saved by the Russian army in 1905 and 1906, and after the humiliation of defeat to Japan, Nicholas desperately sought to stay out of war. 
Although Russia and Britain had been close to war over their competing interests in Asia, Russia's defeat in 1905 dispelled British fears of the Russian threat and led to the signing of the Anglo-Russian Entente of 1907. Together with the Anglo-French Entente Cordiale of 1904 and the Franco-Russian Alliance of 1894, this created the Triple Entente of Britain, France and Russia. The rival European bloc was the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, though the latter's fidelity to the alliance was suspect as it had its own territorial claims to parts of the Austrian Empire. Following the appointment of Sergei Sazanov as foreign minister in 1910, the Tsar pursued a three-pronged policy to remain committed to the Triple Entente, improve relations with Germany, and to promote unity among the Balkan states in Southeast Europe against further Austrian encroachment in old Ottoman territory after Austria's annexation of Bosnia in 1908. Rather than confronting Austria, the Balkan alliance went to war with the Ottoman Empire over Macedonia and Albania in 1912, before fighting each other for the spoils in 1913. While Russian nationalists advocated a pan-Slavic union with the Balkan states, Nicholas was more concerned about German ambitions in the Ottoman Empire. The Russian Empire's Black Sea trade, including its substantial grain exports, passed through the Straits of Constantinople by modern-day Istanbul. In 1913, a German general, Lehmann von Sanders, was appointed commander of the Constantinople garrison. Over the previous century, the Ottomans had routinely employed foreign experts as civil and military administrators, but the Russians feared direct German control of the Straits. Elsewhere in Europe, a naval arms race between Britain and Germany increased the risk of war between the continent's most powerful states. After the humiliation of the Russo-Japanese War, General Suhomlinov embarked on a modernization program, which included the centralization of military administration within the Ministry of War, an increase in the size of the field army to over 1.4 million men, introducing machine gun crews at the regimental level and attaching an aviation detachment to each army corps. On the 28th of June 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne, was assassinated in Sarajevo by Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian Serb student. The Austrian government in Vienna believed that the Serbian government was behind the assassination, and four weeks later, on the 23rd of July, the Austrians issued an ultimatum to Serbia deliberately intended to provoke war. Foreign Minister Sasanov predicted that the conflict would develop into a continental war. Russia would be duty-bound to support Serbia and Germany would join the war against Russia, in turn resulting in hostilities between Germany and France. Since the Anglo-French Entente was not a formal alliance, it was unclear whether Britain would join the war against Germany, but even with Britain remaining on the sidelines, the war would engulf the continent. Nicholas remained optimistic and hoped to come to an agreement with his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, but on the 30th of July, Nicholas was urged by his ministers to order the mobilization of the Russian army, and on the 1st of August, Germany declared war on Russia. On the 3rd of August, Germany declared war on France, and after the Germans crossed into Belgium the following day, the British government answered a Belgian appeal for assistance and went to war with Germany on the 5th. The First World War was greeted in Russia with a rare demonstration of national unity, inspiring confidence in the Tsar that his armies would achieve victory following the example of Russia's victory over Napoleon a century earlier. Most European military planners expected the war to be short, but the German army was the best in Europe, and Germany and Austria enjoyed the strategic advantage of the central position, enabling them to move their armies quickly between different fronts. Among the three Entente powers, Britain and its empire had the greatest potential, but it would take time for those resources to be deployed, leaving Russia and France to do most of the fighting on land. 
In order to avoid a two-front war, the Germans hoped to launch a lightning strike to capture Paris and defeat France while the Russian army was still mobilizing, before turning its attention back east. The Russians took advantage of this by sending two armies into eastern Prussia ten days earlier than the Germans expected, albeit without being perfectly equipped. Despite initial Russian successes, in late August and early September, the German 8th Army under General Paul von Hindenburg and his Chief of Staff Erich von Ludendorff defeated the Russian 2nd and 1st Armies in quick succession at the battles of Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes. Setting aside these disastrous defeats, the Russians managed to hold the Germans at bay in Poland, while a Russian offensive against the Austrians captured Galicia in western Ukraine. By the spring of 1915, the Russian army was facing a shortage of munitions, and after a series of German offensives in Poland, by September the Russians were forced to abandon Poland and Lithuania. The defeats in Poland led to a crisis in the military leadership. A Supreme Commander Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich, with the support of the Duma, blamed War Minister Sukomlinov for the logistical failures. After being imprisoned in the notorious Peter and Paul Fortress in St. Petersburg, the Minister of War was dismissed from office in June and replaced by General Alexei Polivanov. And in December, the Tsar dismissed his uncle Grand Duke Nicholas and assumed the supreme command himself. By doing so, the Tsar was partly placing a check on the Duma leaders, who supported the Grand Duke, but the latter had also proven an incompetent military leader who lost his nerve with his armies in full retreat. Without any meaningful military training himself, Nicholas did not expect to take over control of strategic or operational decision-making, which he left in the hands of his chief of staff, Mikhail Alexeyev. The Tsar hoped that his presence at the front would improve coordination between military and civil authorities, and serve to improve morale among the peasant soldiers that made up the ranks of the Russian army. While there were many advantages to the Tsar taking over command of the Russian army, his presence at general headquarters at Mogilov in modern-day Belarus kept him at a distance from the political situation in the capital city, which had been renamed Petrograd at the beginning of the war to sound less German. On the 7th of September 1915, a majority of the Duma's deputies formed a progressive bloc demanding political reforms and a government which enjoyed public confidence. In other words, they demanded one favorable to the progressive bloc. The bloc's initiatives were supported by the Union of Towns and the Zemstva Union, which were formed at the beginning of the war to coordinate local authorities' support for the war effort. Many of the Tsar's ministers also lobbied for Goromikin's dismissal as prime minister, believing that victory could only be achieved by maintaining political unity and working in conjunction with the industrialists and civil society leaders that led the progressive bloc. Unwilling to work with Goromikin, and horrified by the Tsar's decision to assume the supreme command without consultation, the Council of Ministers effectively went on strike, infuriating Nicholas in turn. While the ministers were afraid that as supreme commander, the Tsar would be associated with military setbacks suffered by the army, Shortly after Nicholas's arrival, the military situation improved as Kiev was successfully defended and the munitions crisis was overcome by effective coordination between the Ministry of War and Russian industry. In the summer of 1916, General Alexei Brusilov led a major offensive into Galicia, which broke the Austrian lines and captured hundreds of thousands of Austrian and German prisoners. The Russian successes forced Germany to redeploy troops from the Western Front, weakening its assault on the French fortress of Verdun and its defense of the River Somme after the British launched an offensive in July. While the army had enjoyed its best year in 1916, an economic crisis at home threatened the continuation of the war effort. A shortage of food and fuel created high inflation and the railway network was ill-equipped to bring food surpluses from the agricultural south to the cities in the north and west, while at the same time moving troops to the front line. While aware of these problems, the economically illiterate Nicholas was incapable of solving them. 
while his ministers were increasingly sidelined. After the ministerial strike in late summer of 1915, the Tsar replaced most of his ministers with individuals who were regarded as reliable supporters of the imperial regime. With her husband away at headquarters, the Empress Alexandra assumed a greater role in the empire's domestic affairs. In January 1916, Goromikin was succeeded by Boris Stürmer, a close confidant of Alexandra. When the Tsar sought to dismiss his interior minister Alexander Protopapov in November 1916 under pressure from the Duma, the Empress urged him not to give in. Alexandra's German origins fueled rumors that she was acting against Russia's interests, even though the Empress was critical of Wilhelm II and regretted the fact that her brother Ernst Ludwig was fighting in German uniform. Alexandra was rumored to be under the influence of Rasputin whom she asked for advice on ministerial appointments. The boastful Rasputin exaggerated his influence and claimed to enjoy the favors of many court ladies, and his presence at court continued to damage the imperial family's prestige at a time when it could ill afford it. Nicholas's relatives were increasingly concerned about Rasputin, and on the 30th of December, a group including Prince Felix Yusupov, who was married to the Tsar's niece, and Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, Nicholas's cousin, shot and killed Rasputin at the Yusupov Palace in St. Petersburg. With the country seemingly on the verge of revolution and unable to find a solution to the economic crisis, the cadet leader Pavel Milyukov stood up in the Duma in November and asked rhetorically, whether the government's failures were caused by incompetence or treason. Once again, Nicholas was asked to appoint a government that enjoyed the confidence of the Duma, a call echoed by aristocrats and members of the imperial family. While he privately recognized the danger of the riots and strikes in Petrograd at the beginning of 1917, Nicholas remained optimistic about the military situation and believed that a planned spring offensive would bring victory and improve morale at home. On the 7th of March, the Tsar left Sarkoye Selo for headquarters, and the following day, disturbances began as the men of the factories joined an International Women's Day demonstration demanding bread. By the 11th, almost all of the capital city was on strike, though initial attempts to control the rioting by troops loyal to the imperial regime were successful. However, on the 12th, the Petersburg garrison mutinied and prompted Nicholas to return to the capital. Striking railwaymen blocked the imperial train and the Tsar was forced to divert to Pskov, where he arrived on the 14th. On the 12th of March, 12 Duma deputies formed a provisional government to take control of the capital, and on the same day the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers deputies was formed. On the evening of the 14th, General Ruski, commander of the Northern Front, headquartered in Peskov, presented Nicholas with a message from President of the Duma, Mikhail Rodzianko, urging Nicholas to grant parliamentary government if he wished to retain his crown. The Tsar initially refused, but when he changed his mind the following day, it was too late, and Rodzianko urged the Tsar to abdicate to prevent further bloodshed. The other generals, assured by the Duma leaders that they were in control, joined in the chorus and urged Nicholas to abdicate. On the 15th of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate in favor of his son, but after several hours worrying about the potential fate of Alexei during a time of war and political instability, decided that he should instead be succeeded by his brother, Grand Duke Michael who would serve as a constitutional monarch. On the 16th of March, under pressure from the provisional government's leaders, Michael decided not to assume the throne until a constituent assembly was convened to determine whether to retain the monarchy. After returning to Mogilov, Nicholas issued a final address to the army on the 21st of March, urging the men to continue fighting and to submit to the authority of the provisional government. Later that day, Nicholas was arrested and taken back to Sarkoye Selo, where he remained under house arrest for the next five months. Though subject to humiliation by their guards, 
Nicholas and Alexandra felt a sense of relief that the heavy burdens of government were taken away from them. There was an expectation that the former imperial couple would go into exile in Britain, and Pavel Milyukov, now foreign minister in the provisional government, submitted a request for asylum to the British government on behalf of Nicholas and Alexandra. The British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was inclined to agree, but the Tsar's cousin, King George V, feared that granting asylum to the former Russian autocrat would damage his standing among British socialists and place his own throne at risk. Even had such an offer been extended, Nicholas and Alexandra would have been reluctant to abandon Russia out of a sense of duty, despite their calamities. In August 1917, the Provisional Government sent Nicholas and his family to the city of Tobolsk in Siberia, where they lived in the former governor's residence. The provincial city remained well disposed towards the fallen Tsar, and Nicholas and the children socialized in secret with the more sympathetic guards. The fate of the Romanovs was destined to get worse after November 1917, when the Bolsheviks under Lenin overthrew the provisional government. Since Imperial Russia used the Julian calendar, which was 12 days behind the Gregorian calendar used by most of the world, the event is known to history as the October Revolution. The provisional government had been unable to assert its political power and was in the hands of the Petrograd Soviet, while the failure of a summer offensive in July strengthened support for the radical Bolsheviks, who demanded an end to the war. In January 1918, the Bolsheviks consolidated their hold on power by closing down the Constituent Assembly, where they were outnumbered by the socialist revolutionaries. Keen to secure his power in Russia, in March, Lenin reluctantly approved the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, with Germany and its allies, surrendering control of Poland, the Baltic states, Belarus, and Ukraine. The Bolshevik suppression of the Constituent Assembly and their capitulation to Germany created the conditions for civil war. In the spring of 1918, the Czech Legion, who were making their way east along the Trans-Siberian Railway in order to join the Allies on the Western Front, staged an uprising against Bolshevik rule. The Bolshevik leadership had not decided what to do with the former Tsar, but Lenin's second-in-command, Leon Trotsky, hoped to bring Nicholas to Moscow for a show trial before executing him. In April 1918, the Bolshevik revolutionary Vasily Yakovlev acted on instructions from the central government to bring Nicholas and Alexandra to Moscow, but on the way they were intercepted by a detachment of Bolsheviks from the Ural Soviet who took control of the convoy and took them to their base in Ekaterinburg. Nicholas, Alexandra, and Grand Duchess Maria arrived on the 30th of April and were imprisoned in the house of Nikolai Ipatyev, a military engineer. The Tsarevich had been ill and had initially been left behind with three of his sisters, but by the 23rd of May, the rest of the family arrived along with their doctor, Evgeny Botkin, and three servants. As the Czech Legion advanced on Ekaterinburg, at the beginning of July, the central leadership in Moscow decided that the Romanovs should be executed in Ekaterinburg. On the 4th of July, the deputy head of the Ekaterinburg secret police, Yakov Yurovsky, was appointed commandant of the Apachev house. In the early hours of the 17th of July, the family and their attendants were brought into the basement. After the twelve men of the firing squad entered the room, Yurovsky announced that the Ural Soviet had decided to execute the whole family. A stunned Nicholas asked, what? Before Yurovsky repeated his orders, and the firing began. Three men in the firing squad claimed that they had fired the fatal shot that accounted for the former Tsar, but regardless of who was responsible, Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, was dead at the age of 50, along with his wife, his five children, and four loyal attendants. Yurovsky ordered his men to hide the bodies at a location where they could not be found by the counter-revolutionary white armies, who were days away from Ekaterinburg. 
the Soviet government claimed in public that only Nicholas had been executed, and even when it became increasingly clear that the whole family had been eliminated, there were rumors that Tsarevich Alexei, or one of his sisters, may have survived and escaped. The memory of the dead Tsar served as a rallying point for the monarchists and counter-revolutionaries who opposed the Bolsheviks, but by 1921, Lenin's forces had won the civil war, and his Soviet regime would remain in power until 1991. From their exile in London, Paris, New York, white émigrés continued to hope for a collapse of Soviet communism and the return of the Russian monarchy. In 1981, the Russian Orthodox Church abroad canonized Nicholas II and his family, and in 2000, the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia also agreed to confer sainthood on them. In the meantime, the remains of Nicholas, Alexandra, and three of their daughters were discovered in a ditch near the Apachev house in the late 1970s, and after DNA identification in 1998, they were buried in a special chapel in the St. Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg. In 2007, further remains were discovered at a nearby site, and later identified as those of Tsarevich Alexei and either Grand Duchess Maria or Anastasia. In 2015, the Russian Orthodox Church ordered the exhumation of five sets of remains in the chapel for further testing. While renewed investigations confirmed the identification of the remains in 2020, as of 2024, they have not yet been reburied in the chapel. The legacy of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia continues to be debated among historians of Russia, and it is closely related to the question of whether it was possible to avoid the horrors of communist rule in Russia in the 20th century. Nicholas had been exposed to revolutionary violence in his early teens with the assassination of his grandfather, Tsar Alexander II, and the political instability would only increase during his own reign. After the unexpected death of his father, Alexander III, in 1894, Nicholas came to the throne unprepared for government. Despite being a well-educated and intelligent man, Nicholas was indecisive and unsocial, and initially found it difficult to stand up to his ministers. As Tsar, Nicholas was able to make his mark in foreign policy, but defeat in the Russo-Japanese War dented his prestige and fueled domestic opposition to his rule. When peasant uprisings and strikes broke out in response to heavy taxation and poor working conditions, Nicholas wavered between granting concessions and suppressing unrest by force. Although personally a kind and gentle man, his unwillingness to surrender the powers which he considered to be given to him by God and his belief that the Russian political system was unsuited to representative democracy meant that he only agreed to establish an elected legislative assembly in October 1905 in order to keep his throne. After doing so, he could only work with the Duma when the electoral laws were amended to exclude the majority of the population. Despite all the difficulties he faced, Nicholas ultimately relied on the army to crack down on disturbances, and it was only the First World War which created the conditions for Nicholas to give up his throne in March 1917. Though a prisoner after his abdication, Nicholas felt a sense of liberation after being relieved of the burdens of government, but any hopes of a comfortable retirement were extinguished by the Bolshevik Revolution, leading to a brutal end at the Apachev House. What do you think of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia? Was he a weak and incompetent ruler, and a brutal autocrat who was responsible for cracking down on political opposition and encouraging anti-Semitic pogroms? Or did he not go far enough in using force to maintain political stability in the empire? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.